Okay, so we went over this a little bit in class the other day, but I'm just going to go through. Um, you have these slides available to you. Um, but basically, this is our introduction to needle felting, which gives a little bit of a history of felt in general and of the needle felting technique specifically, and then goes into the kind of materials you're going to need and the specifics of your two needle felting projects. All right. So first of all, what is felt? Um, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, felt is a textile, obviously. It's a fiber. It's something that we're talking about in fiber art class, so that makes sense. And it is a textile that, unlike um, weaving, where, which I know we haven't done the weaving unit yet, but weaving you have a thread that goes like this around another thread, right? Weaving in and out, and that creates your textile. For felting, it's kind of chaotic, okay? So if weaving, if knitting, if crocheting are these sort of very organized, um, kind of mathematical, basically, sort of patterned ways to create textile, felt is the, cha the chaos agent, okay? So felt is a textile that's produced by matting fibers together. So if maybe like when you were a little kid, if you ever um, got really bad tangles in your hair because you were kind of a wild child who liked to run around outside and like go swimming in the creek and then run around and let your hair dry and then it created an insane knot and your grandmother used to call it a rat's nest which is disgusting and horrifying and then you had to sit very still while it felt like she was pulling all your hair out. I might be venting a little bit personally about myself. Um, I had very long hair always as a kid and if I didn't have it in a braid when I was outside doing stuff I'd always get it all tangled and it was my hair likes to tangle. So anyway that tangling kind of fiber that kind of thing that's basically a kind of felting. Um, okay so um, it's just matting fibers together so it's tangling fibers together and it, they don't have to be particularly organized they just have to become one new flat entity. Okay, so um, there's two major felting techniques. There's needle felting and there's wet felting. We do not do wet felting in this class. Um, even when this class meets in person, rather than uh, meeting remotely, we don't have a good setup for it, basically. Um, the classroom we're in doesn't have sinks. Um, you need a lot of water source. It's very messy, and we just don't really have the right setup to do it. Um, the other kind of felting is uh, needle felting, which we are going to do. Okay, so it can be made from basically any fibrous material. It's most commonly made from wool. Uh, it's very, very old. Let's do a really quick, brief history of felt overview, which as you know from my uh, history of dye lecture, I can go, I can talk about the history of things related to art for a long time. I'm not going to do that now. We're going to do this quite briefly. So felt is probably the oldest textile. Um, there's some evidence, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the history of weaving, that makes weaving a contender as well, but um, we know how old felt is. We know that um, felt has been around for many, many thousands of years. Uh, Sumerian, Mongol, Turkic, and uh, Altaic peoples all have been felt makers for thousands and thousands of years. Mostly um, felting originated with nomadic peoples. For example, the um, the Mongols are, are probably most the most famous of the mo nomadic peoples if you've studied that at all. Um, yurts. So this image that I have is of a yurt. It's like a tent but made out of felt, so it can be quite warm. Um, Ernaman of Lagash was the original person to discover the secret of felting according to Sumerian legend. So this is a legendary figure in their history who figured out how to mat uh, fibers, uh, woolen fibers together to create material and it became a very integral part of their culture because as nomadic people, rather than building things out of stone or wood, having something um, as lightweight as felt that you could collapse and take with you but it would still be warm and still uh, resilient was very important. The other thing about felt that's great and was very helpful for all of these nomadic peoples uh, making their homes and their clothing out of it is wool is naturally um, antibacterial, it's antimicrobial. If you are really into hiking you might have some super fine wool hiking socks. Um, they tend to not get stinky, they tend to not get so smelly, that's because they're naturally antimicrobial. So if this is something you're living in and cooking in and sleeping in, it's helpful if it's something that isn't going to collect um, elements of disease and bacteria. So wool is um, kind of a super fiber in a lot of ways. Um, 
it also can be kind of agitating to people. I'm actually a, I'm allergic to wool, which is sort of funny because I teach five birds. But anyway, wool was very um, versatile and helpful for these people. And felting was a really um, kind of easy uh, way to utilize it in, in different ways. Felt, you can also make different thicknesses. So you can make a very, very thick felt, for the, example, for your yurt, and then uh, felt much thinner for, for things like clothing. Um, an alternate history of the discovery of felt, uh, which is the westernized uh, white people version, is uh, Saints Clement and Christopher supposedly accidentally discovered felt on a pilgrimage by putting wool in their shoes to prevent blisters. So you're walking on a pilgrimage, it's a long journey, your feet are rubbing in your boots, you're going to get blisters. So they took some wool from, from sheep and just shoved it into their um, boots along their where their um, where their feet touched to keep it from rubbing and that friction the rubbing of their foot against the boot and then the moisture from their feet sweating uh, created felt okay so in the westernized version of the history of felt it was invented by these saints who were doing a holy pilgrimage and accidentally made felt within their shoes and then when they had these they pulled it out and it wasn't just fibrous anymore it was this felt material that's kind of where we get things like um, moleskin. If you, again, if you hike, you have those little, it's kind of like a band-aid. It's adhesive on one side and it's fuzzy. It's felt on the other side to keep from rubbing and causing blisters. That was invented by these guys basically um, by accident. So that's an alternate history to the discovery of felt. Okay, felt has lots and lots of uses. It's used in a lot of things that we still use today that you don't maybe necessarily think about. Um, it's very strong. It can be used for lots of industrial purposes. Needle felted felt is used in a variety of ways. Um, starting in the 1950s, needle felting, uh, which is also called needle punch fabric, was originally used to make felt for industrial purposes, um, for use with musical instruments, and also as building materials. So industrial felt is made on a very large scale. Um, so it's made with these large plates, so large metal plates that are perforated, that have holes in them, that have all these special needles that go down through them. Um, and the special needles, which we'll look at some of these close up in a minute, have barbs. They have little notches, little um, sharp points coming out of them. Um, and those are then mechanically moved up and down all at once in these giant plates um, through wool or whatever material they're using, usually wool, and it rips the, the fibers through each other and causes them to tangle, okay? So instead of the, the wetness and the motion agitating and causing tangling, this is just physically like a violent ripping the fiber through itself to cause tangling, okay? Um, so these are used, like I said, usually wool, but in some of the industrial materials, they also use um, synthetic materials like nylon and like um, polyester. Industrial felt is mostly used as a damper. So if you're a musician, you know what the term damper means. It's it's a, a material used to make something quieter. It's placed between car parts to damp the vibrations between the panels and to prevent dirt from entering some of the joints. Um, so not just making things quieter, but reducing um, kind of the shake, the vibration of mechanical things like cars. Um, besides being used for things like blankets and hats and boots and clothing, um, it's also used as insulation and lining and building materials. Um, felt is used a lot for musical instruments. It's used on uh, drum cymbal stands to um, dampen, again, to keep it from vibrating. It's used to wrap uh, bass drum and uh, timpani mallets, so the things that you hit drums with. Um, in pianos, the piano hammers are made of a, a felted core, a felted wool, wooden core. Uh, they're wrapped then with the, the wool felt. Um, industrial made felt is also placed under piano keys so that they don't um, like clank and create sort of an echoey noise. It's also used in accordions and it's also used to make ukulele picks. Um, there's lots of uses for felt in home construction. Uh, weather protection, as I said, um, the, the tendency, the natural tendency of wool to be antimicrobial is also anti-moisture, it's, anti, it's uh, moisture wicking. Um, so it can be used as a weather protection in roofing. Um, it can also be used under floors, under flooring for the same purpose. Recently, clean white scraps of felt from industrial uses are ground up, colored, and put in 
aerosol cans and sold as spray to cover up bald spots. So when you see those infomercials, if you've ever seen those about like basically instant hair in a can for, for people who are balding, that is ground up industrial felt. There you go. Okay, so needle felting. Let's, we talked about this a little bit, but let's kind of get into what needle felting actually is. Um, at the most basic level, to make traditional felt, you need wool, friction, and moisture to interlock the scales on the woolen fiber. So scales. Um, has anyone seen, this maybe is not still a commercial, I think it is, but I think it was a Pantene Pro-V hair commercial. Do you even see commercials anymore? I feel like um, I don't even have television, so I just watch things on Netflix. But it, it shows a kind of a zooming in on a, a hair follicle pre the whatever conditioner it is they're selling, and there's all these little scales sticking up along the hair fiber, and then after you use their magical conditioning product, the hair follicle is smooth and all the scales like lay down. Okay, so hair is a protein fiber just like wool, and if you look at wool under a microscope, just like if you look at hair in a Pantene Pro-V commercial, there are all these little scales sticking up. It's not just a smooth thing. So the scales are what interlock and grab each other to um, create the, the textile during felting, to make things stick together. Okay, so at the most basic level, you need moisture and friction to cause that interlocking when you're wet felting. Needle felting, you don't need the moisture. It is a dry method. So basically these special needles, um, which are used in industrial felting on machines, but which we are going to use just with our hands, penetrate the wool, I mean, they're a needle, that makes sense, and they tangle the upper fibers and the inner fibers and make those scales grab onto each other. And they do that by ripping the wool through itself. Like I said, it's quite violent. Um, industrial needles have been used since the mid 19th century, so like right at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, they were not super widely used until the 20th century when wool waste became um, an option that was used a lot for mattresses. A lot of early mattresses were made out of uh, recycled, upcycled um, industrial felt, and car interiors, things like this. Okay, so needle felting in terms of um, not on the industrial large scale, but for our purposes, for like creative arts and crafts type use. The origin story there um, starts in the 80s, the 1980s. So David and Eleanor Stanwood, they bought what's called a uh, sampling machine for needle punching. So needle punching is another word for needle felting. That's generally we say needle punch when we're talking about the big industrial plates full of needles. Okay. Um, so a sampling machine is, is, it's like a smaller version of these industrial sized machines. Um, it's 12 inches wide and it's a little industrial felting loom and it was used for creating tests, small tests of the fiber before utilizing it in the big industrial huge machines, okay? So Eleanor, who was um, a wool artist, she did, uh, she like spun her own yarn and did lots of dyeing and that kind of stuff. So she started using it and she'd also been doing um, wet felting for some time. She'd do wet felted um, scarves and hats and things. So. She used this machine, this needle felting machine, to inlay colored wool onto her dyed bats for, um, to create like a pattern. Dyed bats are like um, bats of fleece of wool that have been lightly wet felted, basically. So she's taking this wet felted kind of loose textile and then laying different colors of wool on top of it, needle felting it with the needle punch machine so that it all sticks together and she's creating this pattern this way. Um, so during a uh, winter in the 1980s, David figured out that he could take a single felting needle, so pull, he pulls a single needle out of this machine that they have, and by hand could use it to make shapes from the wool. Um, and then Ayala Talpe, who's a, a friend of the Stanwoods, they teach her the technique, and um, they're using the single needle technique that David figured out and they're making um, tree ornaments like for their Christmas tree. So she further develops it into single needle felting um, with a single needle, which is kind of the technique that we know today. Um, and it becomes this kind of big thing in the craft world, basically. So she, um, Ayala Talpe writes the book, 
the felty needle from factory to fantasy and, and writes about how to use this technique. So this all happens way, way back in the 1980s. Um, okay, so here are what these tools look like. Um, I said this when I talked to you the other, the other day, but in terms of needle felty needle brands, if you're going to get one that holds multiple needles, there's one brand that's purple. All their stuff is purple. I can't think what the brand is called right now. Their needles are not as good. They're kind of smooth for some reason. Their barbs are not very sharp. Um, Clover brand, which is this green brand, has better needles. So if you're going to use a multi-tool like that, um, this one is better. You can also get packets of needles in different sizes that are just the loose individual needles like what you see here on the right. They come in different sizes. So you have small, medium, large, and extra large. Um, the small ones are really, really fine, and in theory those are good for details, but they also break really easily. The extra large ones I find a little too big. I think they make too big of holes. I think the medium ones and the large ones are your best bet. Um, and then this upper image is just a zoomed in image of what that needle looks like and why it's different than, say, a sewing needle, because it's not smooth. It has all these little notches, all these little barbs that help grab those fibers and rip them through each other. The other thing that you need is you need a foam block, like what you see on the left. If you search um, online for needle felting foam block, things like this will come up that you can purchase. You can also get them at Michael's here in town, probably at Joann's. You used to be able to get them at Hancock. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, but definitely at Michael's. Um, if you don't, the alternative to the foam block is a needle felting brush, which it looks like the image on the, the lower right here. You can also find those at Michael's or um, online and you just put a needle felting brush. Either one works. You can get the blocks, the, the foam blocks in larger surface area sizes, which is kind of useful, I think, um, in turn, especially the two-dimensional project. Okay, let's just go over some vocabulary um, because I'm, I, we're gonna use these words when we talk about our art, so we need to know what we're talking about. So fleece is just sheared wool directly from the sheep without any processing. It's also sometimes called raw wool. Um, I use the word fleece kind of interchangeably with wool batting and wool roving. Um, but technically fleece is what you take directly off the sheep, okay? When I say fleece, I am talking about wool that has been processed enough that we can use it. I don't expect you to go buy a sheep and share your own sheep. If you have connections to a sheep farm, that's awesome. Sometimes they will give you fleece. You just are gonna have to wash it a couple times. So you wanna wash it like with the soda ash that we use to prep our eco print and rust transfer materials. Um, okay, so I use the term fleece more generally than that, but that's the technical definition. Wool roving, um, so that's long strips of processed fleece that have then been rolled up into thin, like five inch wide strips, which is what is pictured here on the right. Um, wool batting is wool that's rolled up into sheets that are like 20 inches wide. Wool batting tends to be shorter fibers than wool roving, which tends to be longer fibers. Carded wool, that's fleece that's been processed. So that's fleece that's been brushed with these special, there are these big square rectangular um, wooden kind of paddles that have sharp kind of um, points coming out of them and you brush the fleece back and forth between them and that's what gets all the gookus, all the the like dirt and grass and stuff that the sheep run around in. That's what gets all of that out. Uh, combed tops or wool tops, these are commercially prepared fibers which are combed into long loose ropes. They look very similar to the wool roving on the right. Comb tops or wool tops tend to be longer and a little bit finer fibers than wool roving. Um, blending, so mixing fibers of different colors to, you can tell I copied and pasted this definition because colors is spelled the European way, uh, but basically it's just, it's the same as blending with like paint. So blending is just mixing these different wool fibers to come up with a different color. So you can, you can take, say you have a red and you have a yellow, you can take them, layer them, pull them through each other and create something that looks a little bit more like an orange. It's kind of like a uh, Seurat's pointillism. Um, you've had art history, you know who Seurat is. So you put orange and red next to each other and your eye kind of makes it look uh, more of a red orange than just straight red or orange. So you can kind of blend your colors in the same way and you just sort of pull them through each other. So they're not smushing together like paint does, but you're layering, uh, it creates more of a depth of color basically. 
carters. Those are the paddle brush things with the spikes on them that you brush fleece with. You do not need these. This is just part of how the process works. Uh, cardine is the verb version of that. Felt, we've talked about this is any kind of fiber in which uh, any kind of textile in which the fibers are interlocked and entangled. Um, wet felting with moisture and friction or um, dry felting using needles. A felting needle is a long needle with barbs on it that's used for hand machine or industrial felting. The barbs and the needle hook into the fibers and interlock them within each other. When you look at it up close, it just looks like there's little notches out of the needle, basically. Fulling, this is the process after the felt has um, matted and shrunk. Fulling is something that we use more um, with wet felting when we're talking about wet felting, but it's basically you mat it together, you shrink it, and you rub it on a rough surface to um, kind of fluff the fibers up and cause them to intertwine more and become firmer. Inlay, this is an, uh, a needle felt technique um, where you, you have a pre-felted shape, say you make like a little felted uh, maple leaf, let's say, and then you have your um, landscape scene that you're creating and you want to just stick the, the, the maple leaf on your landscape rather than just needle felting it directly into it, you needle felt the shape of the thing first and then you inlay it into the greater design. Moreno, that's a kind of sheep uh, that makes wool. It's kind of a fancier, a nicer kind of wool. Micron, that is the measurement for fiber thickness. Um, that just tells you how um, heavy the individual fibers are. So the lower the number, the thinner, the finer the fibers are. Needle felted bats. So this is um, carded fibers that have been um, basically processed. So it's, it, it's not like raw fleece right off the sheep. It's been carded and, and processed. Um, Nuno felt, this is a, a kind of fabric that's made with wool laminated to silk. So this is, you take a piece of silk and you lay wool on top of it and then needle felt the wool onto the silk. Um, it's very popular, that's why I include it. It's kind of having a moment right now. Pre-felt is when the fibers are laid for felting but are only felted until they are matted but they haven't been shrunk yet. This is a wet felting term. Scales are the little hooks, the little roughnesses on the fibers that you can see under a microscope or on your hair in a Pantene Pro-V commercial. Um, staple, that's the length um, the wool grows on sheep. So different sheep have different staples. So some sheep have a long staple, meaning their fleece grows longer, and some sheep have a short staple, meaning um, they have shorter fleece. So if you're looking for something to needle felt with, sometimes it will tell you long staple or short staple. All that means is how long the individual fibers are. Okay, let's look at just some examples really quick of artists who use needle felting. Danny Ives. Danny Ives is great. She's kind of a local local gal. She's from um, northern Arkansas, but she lived in Springfield for quite some time. She actually used to work. She was a zookeeper at the Dickerson Park Zoo here in town. Uh, she's a friend of mine. Her, um, her, the first place she sold her needle felting things was in the gallery I used to own, which is called Arts and Letters. Anyway, she's awesome. She's become pretty inter internet famous. If you look her up on um, Instagram, she's, uh, her handle is good natured. Um, and then she just published this book recently called painting with wool, which made Martha Stewart's a top 10 list for the year it was published, which was 2019. So that's pretty cool. Um, Danny is super skilled. She does hyper realistic animal portraits. She doesn't just do animal portraits, but that's kind of what she's known for. She does hyper realistic animal portraits using needle felting. She has lots of online tutorials and time lapse videos. And she's she's kind of a, a rad person. She travels all over the world now doing workshops with people. So it's kind of cool because she has like a local connection. Here's just a, an example of one of her pet portraits. And you can see all the different steps. So that's made with uh, needle felting. There's Danny, and there's some more just examples of her work. Healy and Burke, uh, these are a couple of guys who do um, a little bit more fantastical kind of abstract needle felting work. They have been in gallery shows for fiber arts and things, and they tend to do two-dimensional needle felting, but rather than doing the more realistic portraiture kind of thing that we see with Danny, they do a little bit looser, more kind of um, fantasy, imaginative-based sort of things. They're sort of like landscape, but a little bit 
abstracted, basically. Shanna Constam, uh, she's pretty fantastic. So she has an MFA in sculpture. She used to work in more conventional sculpture materials um, like metal. Uh, I think she started maybe in like bronze casting, I want to say. And then she discovered uh, felting as a thing and, and how much easier it is to work with and how you don't have to have access to a metal forge to, to work, basically. So she started doing the same kind of thing she was doing in metal out of felt. And so she uses a combination of wet felting and needle felting. She'll wet felt her core insides and then she needle felts all the layers to the outside. Once you start doing this, you'll have a real appreciation for her work because this is quite time consuming and that she makes these gigantic sculptures. You can see she's there for scale and needle felts them. And you can see if you look close that she's holding her needle felting tool. It's She's made her own. It has a, like a wooden handle and five uh, needle felting needles coming out of it. So she does this whole thing using that. Um, that's pretty wild. Here's some more of her work. I really like her work. I think it's very interesting because she takes this sort of Needle felting has this sort of uh, long relationship in history with um, craft, right? With kind of cutesy, crafty, like little Christmas ornaments and things like that. And I like that she takes this technique that comes from the craft world and applies it to this sort of bizarre, surreal, high art sculptural kind of work. Zoe Williams, same kind of thing. She doesn't use wet felting at all. She does everything. Um, Hand, by hand needle felting and she just uses one needle at a time. Um, she prefers to create really really densely worked, densely packed uh, pieces. She also has a background in fiber in uh, sculpture. I think it's ceramics. I, I think her MFA is maybe in sculpture and ceramics. And then she discovered needle felting. <coughs> Again you don't have to have a kiln. It's very portable. You can work with it anywhere and it can do a lot of the same kind of things. Um, in my class, my experience, I've been teaching this for about 10 years, and my experience is that um, people with a background in sculpture and ceramics tend to really like needle felting and tend to be pretty good at it. Um, so here's some of her work where she's combining a two-dimensional and three-dimensional approach to needle felting. Um, she mostly does fairly monochromatic. She mostly just works in, in white, and then she'll have a little bit of embellishment. You can see on this um, kind of weird elephant trunk alien thing on the right, she goes in sometimes and adds beading to her work. So this has a little bit of beading on the end there. Stephanie Metz, uh, she was also has an MFA in sculpture. She's, um, I think she did like large sort of steel welded type pieces and things like that. She discovered needle felting and how portable it is. Um, and so she's been working in needle felting for, for several years now. Um, she, again, when you start doing this and you see how large she's working, you'll have a real appreciation for her work. You can see her needle felting tool in her hand there. Um, it's, she uses about five needles at a time, but she does these huge, large scale kind of things. Her work is kind of, um, it has a link, they're kind of biomorphic. They have links to um, the natural world, but they're abstracted and kind of strange and surreal. Um, here's just some examples of past work by my students in my class. Um, so these are some a couple of two-dimensional needle felting projects. So on the left, that student was um, a biology major who was pre-med and minoring in art. And throughout the semester, she did work that was related to her other interests in biology. So if you're familiar with Henrietta Lacks, she is a woman whose um, cells helped scientists and doctors understand how cancer works basically um, and this is what a what her cells look like so this is a, a needle folded version of her cell um, in which uh, my student then went in and um, added some beading to add some embellishment there on the right is kind of the idea of a distant out of focus sort of meadow landscape and then a very in focus sort of bordered what the flowers and leaves look like up close a pair of luna moths, a self-portrait with a snake. Um, here's a couple of examples of the three-dimensional work. So this is a troll doll that someone uh, made a few years ago who the body, she um, really tightly worked and tightly needle felted and got really great detail on the face and then she um, left the hair looser, you know, she attached it in and then combed it up more loosely. 
on the right you can see this is the butterfly from the end of the book, the very hungry caterpillar, where she was kind of, she made a um, three-dimensional worm uh, and then she made this to go with it, which was sort of a combination of two-dimensional and three-dimensional needle felting. This one was pretty rad. This is the Cheshire Cat from um, Alice in Wonderland, and she put a wire inside there so he was kind of springy, uh, and it was like the Cheshire Cat when he's sort of unwinding. Then we have Boomer the Bear uh, needle felted for three-dimensional needle felting, and then on the right, my maybe my favorite project anyone's done in three-dimensional needle felting for my class. This is obviously uh, from Where the Wild Things Are, and she jointed his uh, limbs so he was fully uh, poseable and, and pretty, pretty neat. Okay, so for your needle felting assignments, we have 2D needle felting and 3D needle felting. We do one right after the other. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce both of them. So for your 2D needle felting project, your project must be at least 12 by 12 inches. Now, it does not have to be perfectly square. It just has to be approximately that much surface space, okay? Um, your surface must be 95% covered in needle felted material. I don't wanna see a background fabric. I want it to be almost entirely needle felted. Um, you must incorporate at least one hand dyed element and it must be fairly prominent, okay? You should be able to point it out to us in the, in the critique. Your felt must be well integrated in the background fabric. I shouldn't be able to pick it apart. Um, I don't have my long fingernails on like I normally do this semester because we're in a pandemic, so I'm wearing gloves all the time, but usually I just go up and fingernail like this, and if it comes apart, that's not great. Some of your surface levels towards the end, if you want to create more texture and have them more loosely applied, that's fine, but it needs to be pretty well integrated. When you flip it over on the back, there should be a lot of fluffy felt fibers coming through. Um, okay, you may incorporate embellishments or other materials if you want. Scrim uh, works really well. Scrim is basically cheesecloth that's been dyed um, and it creates kind of interesting layer effects. Putting in some translucent layers of fabric incorporated in with between the layers of needle felting is kind of neat. You can experiment with that. Um, your project can be abstract or representational. It does not have to be representational. Most of the students in this class go for representational work. I'm not totally sure why. I am an abstract artist. I enjoy abstract work, so feel free to go that direction. Um, one other thing I'll say on needle felting is you can take yarn and needle felt it in to create patterns and things. If you look at the, um, the legs on, on our wild thing guy, that is yarn that she has needle felted into the final surface. So you just lay it out and then needle felt it in. It can kind of help you in terms of making linear embellishments. 3D needle felting. Uh, your project must be at least six inches in one dimension. So six inches high, six, six inches wide, whatever. It can't be itty bitty. It needs to be big enough that I can kind of see what's going on. In this one also, you must incorporate a hand dyed element and it should be something that you can point out to me. It should be fairly prominent. Uh, your felt, again, must be well integrated into a solid form. I shouldn't be able to pick it apart easily. It shouldn't be super squishy. It should have a little firmness to it. Um, again, on the surface levels, you may leave some wool attached, but less fully integrated for textural purposes. Again, looking back at the troll here, obviously she didn't want to make its hair the same kind of texture as the body. Um, you may also incorporate embellishments here. Uh, some people... If you go to Michael's or online, you can order like eyes that people put in teddy bears and stuff. If you want to do that, that's fine. If you want to incorporate some beads, that's fine. Um, yarn, there's different kinds of things that you can do. Um, your project can, again, be representational or abstract. It does not have to be totally representational. 98% of them are in this class. A lot of people do representational stuff. But if you look back at our artists that we looked at, I mean, you can do something abstract like this. It doesn't have to be totally representational. You can do something kind of fantastical and surreal. Okay, that is needle felting.